everyone is very welcome to the um, St. Uh, St. Council Credit Union Apologies at Learning Centre uh, here at the Butler Gallery for the talk that we're going to ha have today. So I'll introduce Margaret and Roisin who are from the Defence Forces stationed here in James Stevens Barracks. This talk series is happening in conjunction with Amelia Steen's exhibition, The Bloods. We're really pleased that members of the Defence Forces are giving us um, talks. So this is the second in a series of four talks. Um, and just to say that this event is being live streamed for those of you who are here, but we also welcome um, our audience on YouTube. But this will remain on YouTube after the talk as well, so you can point people in the right direction uh, when you go home and let them know uh, that they can see this online. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, the two ladies. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Holly. Um, so we're, we're delighted to be here, and it's a privilege to be asked to give our, this talk today. The title of the talk is Defence Forces, Warriors, Diplomats and Scholars. By no means do we claim to be any of these things, but I can certainly tell you that throughout my career, I have encountered members of the Defence Forces who, who I would put into these categories. So our aim today is really to give you kind of um, a better understanding of the roles of the Defence Forces, and then at the end we'll give a kind of a synopsis of our own careers to date and the different paths uh, we've, we took to to where we are today. Okay, so I'll just, as, as you know, the Defence Forces is a hierarchy, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit briefly about the rank structure. So in the Defence Forces, there's two separate rank structures. There's enlisted personnel and then there's commissioned personnel. So enlisted personnel are those who would join the Defence Forces as a recruit. Um, they would complete the recruit training, two to three star, tra two to three star training, and pass out as a three star private. They would then go on um, throughout their career, they'd do career progression courses, and the ranks would be corporal, sergeant, company sergeant, or company quartermaster, depending on which uh, way they go, battalion quartermaster, and sergeant major is the highest rank in the enlisted uh, personnel. Commissioned officers then, are, these are personnel who undertake a cadetship. So they're the officers of the defense forces. The cadetship is 15 month course, and on um, receipt of your commission, you become either a second lieutenant or a lieutenant, depending on your educational background, basically whether you have a degree or not prior to joining. And then the, the career progression within the commissioned ranks is lieutenant, captain, commandant, lieutenant colonel, colonel, and then you go into your major ranks, so you've, or your general ranks, so you've got brigadier general, major general, and lieutenant general. So lieutenant general is the highest rank in, in the Army. Um, we have three different corps, so Army, Naval Service, and Air Corps, so, and obviously different rank markings, very similar, similar rank structure. So the top ranks here, that's the commissioned officers ranks, so you've, from your cadet to your lieutenant colonel, and the bottom then is the enlisted personnel from your recruit to your sergeant major. The Air Corps rank, um, Ranks are similar in names, and but the slides are slightly, your rank slides are slightly different. So uh, again, from the officers at the top, the officer and the major general then is the highest rank in, currently in the Air Corps. Um, and then the, this is the enlisted ranks. So you've got your apprenticeships, your, your airmen, right up to your uh, regimental sergeant major. So they're very, very similar, just slightly different rank markings. The Naval Service then, the Naval Service is a little bit uh, si similar structure as in you go from your cadet uh, lieutenant all the way up and again with the enlisted ranks it's, it's very similar. There are differences obviously in the rank markings but there's slight differences in the names of the ranks. So for example a lieutenant in the Navy is the same as a captain in the Army, a captain in the Navy is the same as a colonel in the army. So you can see why it's, it's necessary for everyone to know the ranks because you don't, you don't want to mix up a captain with a colonel rank. Um, another point to note, vice admiral is, is the equivalent of lieutenant gen general in the army. So in 2015, a history was made when um, a vice admiral was appointed chief of staff. So the, chief, uh, the current chief of staff is uh, Vice Admiral Mark Mellet. Uh, this is the first time uh, in the history of the state that 
a Navy person, or sorry, a, a person other than an Army um, was appointed as the Chief of Staff, and he's the 29th Chief of Staff in the Defence Forces. Okay, so the Defence Forces then, it's broken down into three different services. So you've got your Army, Air Corps and Naval Service, and then we, we also have um, a Reserve Force. The Reserve Force caters only for Navy and Army. There's no Air Corps uh, Reserve presently. Our lecture is really going to focus mainly on Army because the exhibition is, uh, is Army focused, but I will give um, a brief description of the roles that the Air Corps and the Naval Service provide. So the Defence Forces itself, the establishment is 9,500, but we're currently under strength at 8, 000, approximately 8,420. Out of that 8,420, there's uh, 585 females. So the, the females represent just under 7% of the, def the Defence Forces personnel. Um, in the last number of years, there's been, I suppose, huge progression in terms of uh, female involvement, there's been certainly more, more females joining and there's been progression up um, through the ranks. So, for example, in the Army, the Army would have the majority of the, the females. So in, uh, in the Army, you'd have the highest, I think, ranking in the enlisted would be, C we have CS company sergeants and company quartermasters and there, there's, there's quite a few uh, female company quartermasters and sergeant maid and uh, company sergeants. There hasn't yet been a sergeant major or, or a battalion quarter master, but it is only a matter of time. Uh, in the commissioned ranks, then, we at uh, the highest ranking female officer is a uh, brigadier general. Um, so it's Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien, and she's currently deputy deputy commander in Undaf, which is in Syria. Um, she was the first female to become a lieutenant colonel. She was the first female to become a colonel, and obviously the first female that to become a general. In the army, in 1980, the first intake of females happened in the army. So 1980, there was um, female cadets, and then they got commissioned in 1981. And also in 1981, there was the first female, all, uh, all female recruit platoon. So there has been like nearly 40 years of, of females in the defense forces. Uh, in the Air Corps, uh, it's probably, it represents the smallest percentage of females, um, but there are, there are uh, female pilots. So last year, Lieutenant Cusack became the first female pilot in, um, to be qualified in, with, in the last 15 years. And then the Naval Service, so you may have heard in the news recently there's been a good bit of progression within the Naval Service. It's been highlighted a good bit in, in the media. Um, last Friday, in fact, the, the, uh, a lady was, was promoted to the rank of commander, so Commander R Roberto O'Brien. She's the highest ranking female in the Naval Service. And the Naval Service only took uh, an intake of cadets in 95, and she, was, she happened to be part of that class. Another, I suppose, progression or a milestone that, that has been recent enough in the Navy was um, the first female diver qualified in August. So her name is Lieutenant um, Talia Britton. She was obviously the first female diver, diver ever in the Defence Forces. This course is extremely strenuous and it's a very tough course. It has a 70% failure rate so you can imagine, you can only imagine how hard the course is. Um, they would dive down to depths of 38 metres under, under the seas. Okay, so just briefly talk about the different corps within the Air Army. So the Army is organized along uh, conventional military lines um, and it has a sufficiently flexible structure in order to carry out the roles assigned to it by the government. There's uh, nine different corps. So the first corps I'll talk about is the Infantry Corps. The Infantry Corps, myself and Roshin would argue, is the best corps because we're in the Infantry Corps. So. The Infantry Corps <coughs> is basically the men and women on the ground. They're the combat soldiers. It's broken into light infantry and mechanized infantry. There are seven infantry battalions in the, the country and one mechanized company. So everyone is basically trained as an infantry soldier. Soldier, you're able to work 
self-sufficiently carry in um, all your equipment and your weapons, whereas mechanized has that extra, um, extra addition of uh, armor personnel carriers. So it, that adds security and uh, mobility to um, the infantry soldier. Um, as I said, there's seven different battalions. There's uh, an infantry ethos um, that's based on eight different principles. So they are to acquire physical robustness and resilience, to uh, promote mission command, to foster teamwork, strive for pr professional excellence, uh, collaborate with supporting arms, uh, in encourage uh, loyalty and uh, promote pride. Uh, and the final one then, is one that you'd hear most in the infantry units. It's, it's usually mentioned when times are kind of tough or in training establishments uh, when things may be, may be difficult, but you'd often hear soldiers saying, embrace hardship. Okay, so they're the principles. Second core then, the artillery corps. So they provide support to the infantry um, soldiers and that's in, in, the, in terms of fire support. So they're, trained and brought up, uh, up to speed on, the, on, on their weapons within the artillery corps. The cavalry corps then, they basically operate out of armor. Um, they have a fairly modern uh, fleet of armor, um, which has, uh, I suppose, high specification uh, reconnaissance equipment. They could they would be seen as subject matter experts in relation to intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition, and rec reconnaissance. So basically, they're gathering info and uh, and into, and intelligence, and they provide commander on the ground with a with a better situational picture. Engineer corps then is very technical core. The engineer corps can be uh, broken into kind of two different branches. So you've got your um, combat engineer side of things where uh, soldiers would be trained in like um, demining, in building bridges, building roads, that kind of thing. And then you've got your general engineering, which is required for all the maintenance of all the barracks, the maintenance um, for like down to electricity, water supply within, within the defense forces. The engineers also have specialist search teams and they have a firefighting service within the engineers as well. Uh, CIS core is the communications information system. So this, they provide all the information and communications um, for the defense forces. Again, a highly um, technical core. The ordnance then, so ordnance core again is broken into two areas. So you've the logistical element, element and the operational element. So from a logistical point of view, uh, the ordnance would procure, they'd maintain, they'd inspect all weapons and equipment in the defense forces. They would also look after um, the procurement of clothing. So this is everything from your daily uh, dress to body armor um, and any specialized uh, clothing that's required. Um, they look after uh, rations then is the final thing. So that's from the logistical point of view. From an operational point of view, the ordnance have the only explosive ordnance disposal team uh, in the country, so they operate very closely with the Garda Sheikhan. They also have armor people trained up as armors. So, for example, um, at overseas or within the units, weapons need to be checked, and inspected, and maintained, and the armors do this. So, again, quite technical. And um, there's oh, there's usually a detachment sent overseas on each trip. The medical corps then, the medical corps is all our doctors, nurses, dent, uh, dental teams, um, physios, pharmaceuticals. So basically covers all the health and looks after the welfare of uh, the Defence Forces personnel. Um, just a point to notice was the director of the medical corps is actually also female, so it's a, a Colonel um, Mary Murphy. Uh, Transport corps then, Transport Corps is, is our f the Defence Forces fleet. It, it ensures the transport of personnel and equipment and that it's done safely. And finally, the military police. So military police are there for the prevention, investigation of any offences. They enforce, they're the enforcers of discipline and the general policing of the Defence Forces. Uh, the 
the military police would work at national and local level with the, the Garda Síochán. They also would, would usually have a detachment overseas and um, traditionally they also would be involved in state and ceremonial events. Okay, so uh, as well as the different corps, we have a number of uh, other areas in the army. So JTF is Joint Task Force. Uh, the, at the moment we have a joint task force in place um, specifically for COVID. The name of the task force is Operation Fortitude. So basically they come together for a specific task um, and it's a joint, so it's a joint task force. So it's a comprise of the Naval, Air Corps, Army and Reserve personnel. They're under one command and the, the person in charge of the Joint Task Force at the moment is Brigadier General uh, Brian Cleary. Um, I suppose kind of an example of what they would do, they basically carry out roles within the capabilities and means of defence forces um, in, with giving assistance basically to the different government departments and agencies such as the Department of Health and HSE. Uh, I suppose the most relevant example for us here would be with the 3rd Battalion here in Kilkenny. We, on a daily basis we provide marshals for all the testing centres in uh, Kilkenny, Waterford, Clonmel and Wexford. Okay. The ARW, so the ARW is the Army Ranger Wing. These are our elite force. You must be in the Defence Forces to apply for the, the Army Ranger Wing. Uh, there is a fairly strenuous selection process. There's it involves a four-week four week selection course, extremely high failure rate. Um, the Army Ranger Ring only accepts basically the best. You have to, not only do you have to be uh, highly competent tactically and technically, you must be physically and mentally robust and you must um, have the character and basically have the general uh, personality for the Ar Army Ranger Wing. The Equitation School then, the Equitation School was founded in 1926. Uh, it was basically founded to promote Ireland and the Irish horse. Um, the Equitation School, I suppose it has, a hit. internationally it's seen as the backbone of, of Irish show jumping and eventing. And members of the Equitation School have represented Ireland at the Olympics, um, at world and at European level. And finally, we have uh, Defence Forces School of Music. So Defence Forces School of Music has our number one army band, and then also that you've got uh, the band of one brigade and the band of two brigade. So the army band basically provides uh, for all ceremonial events. It's been, the army band has, uh, has been at every presidential inauguration. And as well as ceremonial events, um, the bands in each of their regions would contribute significantly to the local culture and arts. Okay, so the way the <coughs> Defence Forces is organised, so we have all our different corps, and we ha so we have our infantry and then all our, all our different corps. Um, the way it's organised, you've got your Defence Forces headquarters, then you have one brigade, two brigade, and Defence Forces training centre. So I'm just going to briefly go through each of those and their locations. So Defence Forces headquarters, is in Newbridge, is between Newbridge and McKee. Um, our Chief of Staff, Vice Admiral Mark Mellet, and his assistant, Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Adrian Omoraku, are based in Newbridge. They have, with them, they have the Strategic Planning Branch, they've got the Press um, Public Relations Branch, and they also, the Military Judge is also located um, with them. The headquarters then is split into two different areas. So the Chief of Staff has two Deputy Chiefs of Staff. So Deputy Chief of Staff, Antti McKenna, is over operations. So he basically will look after intelligence, um, planning, and um, training and education. So they're kind of his, his area of responsibility. And those offices are, again, located between Newbridge and McKee. And his second, the Chief's second, uh, Deputy is Major General Sean Clancy. So again, he's the highest uh, ranking officer in the Air Corps. He is the, the Deputy Commanding Chief, or Def, Deputy Chief of Staff of Support. So the, the branches that would come in under his command would be uh, J1, which is Human Resource, and J4, which is Logistics. 
So this is basically for the whole of the Defence Forces. He also, there's also a, a Transport Ordnance Engineer Medical and MP branch and the Chaplaincy Service would also come under his command. Okay, so one brigade then. So General Officer Commanding One Brigade is General Brigadier General Patrick Flynn. His area of responsibility is basically the south of the country. So it's all of Munster, Carlow, Leash, Kilkenny, Offaly, uh, Wexford and Galway. There's three infantry battalions in one brigade and there are the, the headquarters is in Cork. So the three battalions are one battalion in Galway, 12th battalion in Limerick and 3rd battalion here in Kilkenny. The, as well as those areas, he is, he's also responsible for certain vital installations such as uh, Shannon, Cor uh, Shannon Cork Airport and the, the docks in Cork. Okay, so two brigade then, two brigade general officer commanding is Brigadier General Tony Cudmore. So he's basically responsible for the rest of the country except for the Curra and the Glen of Amal area. Okay, so he's got four infantry battalions. So he's got the 6th battalion in Athlone, he's the 7th battalion in Dublin, the 26th or 27th in Dundalk and the 28th which is in uh, Finner Camp in Donegal. And uh, the vital installations I suppose that would be relevant to his area would be uh, Arson Uchtaran, the government buildings, um, the embassies, any foreign embassies, as well as Knock Airport, Dublin Airport and the docks in Dublin. Okay, and just within, within, within each of those brigades, so he has the infantry battalions and at each of the, say, HQs, there, there are core elements. So there are elements of the artillery, uh, cavalry, transport, etc. Then the Defence Force Training Centre, the General Officer Commanding is Brigadier General David Dig Dignam. He's responsible for the Curra Camp area and Glen of Amal. So unlike the two brigades, uh, General Dignam's uh, uh, brigade as such is all in the one location, okay? So it's, uh, he's got all his assets right on his doorstep, whereas, whereas uh, the, the other two generals will have, have to kind of um, have unit commanders. Well, he has unit commanders too, but um, it's, it's uh, all in the one area. So it's broken down as follows. So there's a number of units like there would be in the other brigades and there is the infantry is a mechanized infantry so it's a little bit different to the brigades in the brigades it's light infantry so it's a mechanized infantry here so this is where the armor personnel carriers um, are this is where the training is conducted for personnel who are going overseas uh, etc on, on those but I suppose the Defence Force Training Centre really is the, the centre of excellence for training and education for the Defence Forces. And there is a military college there. So the CNS school is the Command and Staff School. This is the school is for the professional development and uh, education of senior officers within the Defence Forces. The school is affiliated with the National, um, or sorry, N M U N uh, National College of, um, or National University of Ireland in Maynooth and um, the affiliation is, is through um, an MA programme. So they, they provide uh, so the lectures associated with that. The cadet school then, the cadet school is for the training and education of um, cadets who, are, who go on to become officers in the Defence Forces. It was founded in 1928 and since then over 3,000 uh, cadets have successfully been commissioned into the permanent Defence Forces. So they basically train, um, leader, train the cadets to be leaders of character and competence and they go on to, to, um, to the units within the Defence Forces. The infantry school then, so the infantry school, it, there's three wings in the infantry school. So there's an officer training wing, there's an NCO training wing and there's a, an infantry weapons wing. The infantry school really is for junior officers and NCOs and it really harnesses their development and their career progression. So the officer training wing will, will provide courses for young officers, the NCO training wing will provide courses for NCOs and the infantry weapons wing, they're the subject matter experts when it comes to 
training NCOs and officers to be military instructors on certain weapons. They also conduct the sniper badge testing and they monitor all um, they monitor all del delivery of courses within the units on weapons, etc. Military admin schools. So in the military admin schools, where you go to do courses specific to personnel management and logistical courses, DF Physical Education School is basically the ex Centre of Excellence for uh, Physical Education. They have, uh, I suppose, a state of the art facility there in the Curra where they have a swimming pool, they also have um, a, a diving pool and they would run courses from basic swim course right up to physical instructor course. And the UN, tra UN Training School of Ireland, the primary focus in the UN Training School is for training and education prior for personnel going on peace support operations. But they also run international uh, courses and um, they've had over fix uh, people from over 56 different countries and this covers all continents. Okay, so that's kind of a general overview of the Army, kind of in a, in a snapshot. I'll just talk about the Air Corps briefly now. So the Air Corps is based in Casement Aerodrome in Baldonnell. The General Office, Officer Commanding the Air Corps is Brigadier General Rory O'Connor. The way the Air Corps is organised, they've got a, a HQ element, they've got two operations wings, two support wings, and they have an Air Corps college. So the operations wings are split into fixed, uh, fixed wing planes, and, or fixed wing, wing aircraft, and rotary wing aircraft. Um, so the fixed wing have six squadrons and nine different uh, aircraft, and the rotary have three squadrons with eight different aircraft. The support element then, so they've did two support uh, wings. One is for the maintenance and um, procurement and that of, of parts for the aircraft and the other side is basically all the logistical support that's required for the Air Corps to function. And then finally, if you, you have an Air, Corps, an Air Corps college and in the Air Corps college, you've got your cadet college which basically trains uh, pilots. You've got your technician and apprenticeship school which will train all the technicians and apprenticeships required for, for the Air Corps. And there is a military and a survival school also. So the Air Corps are actually, they specialize kind of in survival instructor training. So in the units around the Defense Forces, uh, survival courses, basic survival course or courses are offered. But the Air Corps is the only um, unit in the Defense Forces that runs a survival instructor course. So the different uh, roles of the Air Corps, so the, the Air Corps really is our, our air defense, but in kind of peace times as, as such, uh, they provide kind of a, a roles assigned to them by the government. So examples would be air ambulance, guard air support, kind of military air support. They would do maritime patrols in conjunction with the Navy. And they also um, have the ministerial um, air transport service. Okay, so that's the Air Corps. Finally then the Navy. So the Navy are based in Hal Boland. So this is Hal Boland here, uh, down in Cork. And um, the officer commanding the, the Naval Corps is Commodore Michael Malone. So the Naval Service, again, it's, it's similarly broken down like, like the Air Corps. You've got your HQ, you've got your operations command, and you've got your support command. So, and, and as well as your, your Naval College. So your operation command would look after all the operations uh, ashore and afloat and the support command provides all the logistical um, functions required for the, for the naval service to uh, function. Uh, the, naval, the naval colleges then, so, so you've got your, again, your cadet college, you've got your naval, school of naval engineering, you've got your military, um, basic military school as well, and then there's the maritime, national Maritime College of Ireland as well, so and they, they are affiliated with CIT. CIT. So na the Navy really is um, the, mar the Naval Service is the maritime component of the state's defence, and they they are like the state's primary seagoing agency. So there's nine nine vessels. Um, two out of the nine, unfortunately, are not at sea because their crews are not available. Currently, the Naval Service is under strength 
by 19%, so it's a significant uh, number. Um, but the Naval Service has carried out like very important uh, roles in, in, in it, since it's like uh, has been in service. So examples would be um, uh, drugs uh, seizures and more recently rescuing uh, personnel in the Mediterranean. So I suppose sp specific examples would be in 1999, uh, the LE Orla seized 18 million, euro, 80 million euros worth of canna cannabis resin off the west coast of Cork. In 2008, they seized 750 million euros of cocaine. Um, and then I suppose the most recent, uh, most recent operations would be um, the rescue missions in the Mediterranean. So 2016, 2017, they conducted a number of uh, rescue missions in the Mediterranean for Syrian refugees. In 2016, they rescued uh, 2,491 uh, uh, refugees, and unfortunately, they also had to rescue 20 or had to take on board 21 deceased personnel. So they recovered 21 deceased from from the waters. In 2017, they recovered 704. Uh, refugees and three uh, deceased personnel were recovered. Um, so hopefully we've given you a, a good kind of overview of the Defence Forces. Uh, Lieutenant O'Driscoll now is going to talk about uh, overseas. So overseas and peacekeeping is an essential part of the Defence Forces and what we do. So peacekeeping helps uh, countries that have been torn by conflict to establish and create the means for a lasting peace. So uh, contingents in peacekeeping um, operations are generally infantry units and they're lightly armed for their own protection only. So they're not going over there to start or to cause conflict or to even get involved in conflict. In fact, we have uh, very strict rules and regulations that we have to follow in regards to uh, firing our weapons. So our first contribution, or the first Irish contribution to a peacekeeping environment was in 1958 when 50 Irish officers were assigned to the United Nations Observer Group in Lebanon as observers. Uh, following this then we had uh, the first Irish mission with an armed contingent between 1960 to 1964 in Congo. Now, since then uh, Ireland has continuously provided uh, to the peacekeeping missions all over the world. Some of the current places that we still go to today would include Lebanon, Syria, uh, Kosovo, Mali and Western Sahara. So an overseas trip is generally six months long um, and prior to being deployed you would do pre-deployment training which is roughly two months long and is broken up into four phases. So the first phase would be your admin, so making sure all personnel travelling overseas have the correct admin uh, filled out and completed. So that would be your fitness tests, your ranges, your medicals, dentals, everything in order for you to be eligible to go overseas. So phase two then would be your preparation and practice. So it's usually done at the lower levels, so platoon levels, and it's basically preparing everything you need for overseas as well as practicing any skills and drills that may need to be implemented when you go overseas. The third phase of pre-deployment is what we call the MRE. So this is the mission readiness exercise. So it's basically an exercise we conduct just before going overseas that stimulates what we would be like as a unit overseas. And it basically assesses and tests uh, different modules that we would have to complete and evaluate how mission ready we are to, to proceed to go overseas. The fourth phase then is continued training which actually takes place when you go overseas to the mission area and it's training you carry on throughout your duration of being overseas. So just to touch briefly on the two people pictured here, first we have uh, Brigadier General Ger Jared Buckley so uh, Brigadier General Buckley was commissioned in 1983 into the artillery unit and since then has held a range of different uh, appointments at brigade to DFHQ levels. His current role is as the Irish military 
um, representative to the EU and NATO. So NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So EU and NATO uh, cooper cooperate on uh, common, common interests or common issues and uh, work side by side when dealing with crisis management, uh, capability development, and the third one being government uh, consultations. So his role is basically to be the Irish representative to this organisation. So then we have pictured uh, Brigadier General Maureen O'Brien. So as previously said, she, so sorry, she was commissioned in also 1983 to the infantry unit. And as previously said, she was the first female to reach the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel and then Brigadier General. So her current appointment is the Deputy Force Commander in UNDOF. Um, UNDOF is the United Nations uh, Disengagement Observer Force in Syria. So if you take it that a force commander in a UN mission is responsible for all military forces deployed within their mission area, uh, the deputy is their second in command, which is the role uh, Brigadier General uh, O'Brien holds. So then I'll just move on to the careers. So there are a massive variety of different career paths you can choose to, to take or to follow when joining the DF. So starting, I suppose, with the Army, there's two different paths. You have cadets and you have recruits. So the cadets is a 16 or 15 month long training in the Cura, and at the end or of completion, you will become a commissioned officer, which are generally the uh, managers, organizers, planning and decision makers of the defense forces. The other route then would be the recruit. So upon entering, you would complete a 15 week uh, training course. Then at the end of this 15 weeks, you would generally get a week or two of a break and then come back to do a further six weeks. Upon completing the further six weeks, then you will, be, you will pass out as a three star private and progress up the ranks. Um, for both cadets and uh, recruits, if you finish, when you finish your, your training, you will be given the option then to choose which corps, which Captain Ogan has talked about to go into, so artillery, cavalry, all that. Um, then moving on to the Air Corps. So the Air Corps again have two paths, you have the cadets and you have the aircraft technicians. So the cadets are the same as the Army. On completion, you become a commissioned uh, Air Corps officer and uh, pilot. So you start with your military training, which is nine months, and you do it in conjunction with the Army cadets in the Curra. Following this, then you would go to Baldano and you would complete your military aviation training. So to become qualified to fly the different aircrafts we have. Um, and then you would become a commissioned uh, Air Corps officer and pilot. The other route then for the Air Corps is the aircraft technicians. So this uh, is the equivalent rank to that of the Army's recruit. So on initial training, they do seven months initial uh, training. And then following this, then they would do a three and a half year uh, technical training uh, program. So this basically will qualify them on all the different aircraft systems and um, engines and everything so that they would be fully, fully quali qualified to work on our different aircrafts. Moving on then to the Navy, again two different entry routes, the cadets which do the first part of their training with um, the Army and the, the Air Corps in the Curra. Following this then they would go to Halbolan and they would complete their military tra training and then they would have to complete a year in the National Maritime College. So on completion then they would be a commissioned naval officer. Their other route then is the recruit route. So they do 18 weeks of training and then on completion of the 18 weeks, they get to choose what branch of the naval service they want to go into. So whether that be uh, communications, mechanics or supplies. Following their decision, then they'll have to do a further uh, max 12 weeks training in that specific area. So then we have the Defence Forces uh, defense studies program. So for uh, the cadets, whether you go in with a level eight 
or don't have one, a requirement of uh, an officer in the Defence Forces is to complete a level 8 degree. So for the people who join the cadets having already uh, acquired their level 8 degree, it doesn't really apply to them. But the, uh, the people who join the cadets who are either straight from school or haven't gone to college yet, they will be sent to college to complete their level 8 and it will be fully, uh, fully covered by the Defence Forces. Likewise, for the uh, enlisted route, there is a Defence Studies programme where any enlisted rank who is interested in furthering their academic career uh, can apply for this course and it's a leadership management and defence studies course that is ran through uh, IT Carlo Minute or CIT in Cork. Also along that line if there is different courses available to personnel that may be of beneficial may be of benefit to the defence forces such as logistic courses or anything like that cases can be made for personnel to uh, attain these courses uh, while being covered by the defence forces. So there's three then, uh, I'm just going to touch on the three direct entry routes you can go for career-wise in the army. So the first two being the dental and medical route. So if you hold a fully uh, or a full qualifications in either as a, either a dentist or a doctor, you can directly you can apply for the direct entry route to become a military dentist or doctor. So this route, you would go directly in and become a commission captain. You wouldn't have to do the intense training, 60 months training that uh, a normal army cadet would have to do, but you would be required to finish a a uh, military induction course. Um, then the other entry route would be the army band. So obviously enough this is the military instrumentalists who would provide musical support for uh, any of the army ceremonies held and also some government functions. So prior to going into this you would need to be fully, a fully competent musician. You'd also have to sit uh, an audition and again on being successful for this you would have to complete uh, a military induction training which would uh, teach you the basics of marching and the rank structure and about the DF and then you would be qualified to partake in the band. So they're just a range of the different career paths you can take within the army. Okay, so I hope that that gave you kind of a, a greater appreciation of what Defence Forces do and our kind of our role. Um, we're now just going to tell you a little bit about, uh, about our own kind of story. So, I'm in the Defence Forces 13 years. Um, I kind of did things a little bit differently in that I did recruit training and I did the, uh, a cadetship. Um, so, when I was doing my leave and start back in, God, 2006, I think it was, um, I, we had a... Um, a Defence Force personnel to visit the school and they gave us a, an exhibition and a talk and I went home thinking god this is really cool and I'd love to join the Defence Forces so went home and I said to my parents I'm going to join the army and I was quite quickly told no you're not you're going to college so off I went to college um, I did a degree in social science in UCC and on my final year there I was, I was playing uh, soccer with a, a local team in Cork and uh, one of the girls on the team was in the Defence Forces, she actually is still in the Defence Forces but she had just recently come back from overseas and she was telling me all about her trip and it just sounded like amazing so I said this time I'm, I'm definitely joining so I applied and then I told my parents so um, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't say no once I, once I had applied but when I applied I didn't really probably didn't research it uh, as much as I should have. I didn't know the difference between a recruit. I didn't really know anything about the army because I know other than that private, that's literally all I, I knew about the army. So I joined as a recruit in 2007. I actually trained here in the Turr Battalion, Kilkenny. I did my two to three, I did my recruit training, two to three star training, and then I would have passed out as a private and I remained in the barracks here for, I think it was two and a half years. Um, during that time, I had the opportunity to go overseas. I went to Chad with the 98th Infantry Battalion. This was 
one of, I suppose, the best experiences I've had in the Defence Forces. It was like being transported into a different world, really. Um, we were with the U4 to Chad was the mission, so our role kind of was there to uh, provide safe and secure environment for the, the civilians in Chad uh, to assist the humanitarian agencies and just provide perfection, protection for our own UN soldiers. Um, things that were very scary initially, so like this, you see, see um, just these are young boys basically with weapons. This was probably one of the scariest things I saw at the start, but it, it soon became normal after a few weeks out there. Um, some of the, re the things that really kind of struck that you're actually in a third world country was the poverty. It was extreme poverty, there was, like most of the kids had, were going around barefoot. Um, but one thing that really struck me was all the kids were happy. They were, they were all, always smiling and laughing. Um, this group of kids and the, this lady here, that day, uh, you can see the, the little girl looking up at me, that day we, had, uh, we were taking pictures for, of them and uh, we were showing them on our digital cameras, the pictures, and you actually wouldn't believe that they were pointing each other out. They'd never seen their own reflection. They, had, like, they, don't have, they didn't have mirrors. So just like some of the things that we really took for granted would really kind of like realize how lucky you are and where, where you were kind of uh, brought up in that. Um, so, sorry, no, so, so out there we used to patrol every, every two weeks we'd go out and patrol and then you'd be back in camp doing uh, general duties. So that's, this is just, uh, you'd be kind of, at night time you're in a one man tent and you're kind of in around 360 cover, so beautiful kind of sunsets and just things you, you would, I never really imagined that I, I would see. These pictures here are the, the villages. This is actually their shops. Um, this is where I slept, so I was lucky enough to have a desk, but it's literally a mozzinet and a bed. Um, and then this, uh, the only buildings that I saw out around the area where, where we were working in uh, was mosques. They were literally the only buildings. Every, all the houses were mud huts, um, or kind of makeshift houses. So it really was just, I suppose, very lucky to get the opportunity to have that experience. Um, when I returned then, uh, I came back to the, the Third Battalion and I applied for a cadetship under kind of the guidance of my uh, my battalion commander and my platoon commander at the time. And I was successful and I joined the cadets in uh, 2009. Um, I completed my 15 months and after I was commissioned as a lieutenant. So I was commissioned as a lieutenant because I had a, a degree prior to joining. If, if I didn't have a degree, you'd be commissioned as a second lieutenant. I was then stationed in 12th Battalion in Limerick. I spent about five years, I'd say, in, in Limerick and I, it, I had a variety of roles. I was platoon commander, uh, I was in logistical roles and ad different uh, kind of admin roles. Um, I was involved there with a, kind of a cycling team as well and um, I also had the opportunity to, to undergo uh, a master's in UL while I was in Limerick. Um, so the battalion commander in Limerick at the time was very much uh, pro-education and he encouraged me to go do the master's I did it part-time and it was partially funded by the Defence Forces. Um, in 2015 then I got selected for overseas, so this is my second overseas trip. Uh, very different kind of role from the last one, so the, in the last in Chad I was a private, this time I had much more responsibility, I was now a platoon commander. Um, <clears throat> I would consider myself very lucky to have got the chance to, to go overseas as a platoon commander. So in the cadet school you train to be a platoon commander, but not everyone actually gets to, to be a platoon commander overseas. Um, so I, my platoon came from all different parts of the country. You know, during our pre-deployment train, training, myself and our sergeant just really worked on gelling the, the, that platoon as a team together. And it, it really um, helped us throughout the trip. So we became quite a tight unit. Um, we spent so in, the, in uh, UNIFIL, so we were the 49th Infantry Group in UNIFIL. We, <coughs> the, the kind of main post was in, it was UN Post 245, then there's two outposts, UN 652 and 650. 
650 was manned by Finnish personnel at the time and 652 was by Irish personnel. So my platoon got, myself and my platoon were on that post for eight weeks at the start and then we were also there at the end for about four weeks. So it was a great experience. You're kind of king of the castle out on the post um, and it's, it's um, again, a very different experience but a, a very, very enjoyable one also. On my return from UNIFIL, I spent a brief period back in, in Limerick and then I went to the NCO training wing to instruct on uh, NCO courses. So it was basically a standard NCO course where, where the students were corporals training to be sergeants. Um, following this, I instructed for approximately three years in the cadet school. So again, this was probably one of the one of the major kind of achievements that I would have had in my career because you really see um, the cadets develop over their 15 months of training. It was quite rewarding. We, I was the first class that I was with were the 93rd cadet class. They were the largest cadet class uh, of the state. Uh, the second class then was the 94th cadet class, and uh, Lieutenant O'Driscoll there was in, was in that class. So. She might have liked me a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, a very rewarding, uh, very challenging job, but, but extremely rewarding. And um, I had a great, a great, really have a great time, great memories from there. After, so last March, I finished up in the cadet school last March, and I would have came to third battalion here in Kilkenny. So back kind of to where, where it all started. Uh, my role uh, was in one of the companies, so I was ac acting company commander for Sport Company, so it was just the day-to-day -day runnings of the company. I then got selected for overseas and again back to UNIFIL. This would have been in a different uh, role, so it was kind of a more staff officer role, so I was assistant adjutant, so basically uh, that's a HR role. I would have been involved in all the processing of uh, the the unit, um, so it's 115th Irish pole bat. So the Finnish, the Finns had gone, and uh, we had Polish soldiers now in, instead. So um, I was involved in like processing of all the admin leave, that kind of thing. We had um, an excellent trip with great group of people. Um, I suppose the only kind of the only bad part prior to the trip was when, when COVID hit uh, last uh, January or February. And on, we were due back in May, unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to, to come back to Ireland until July. And um, my cell, I suppose, was, was, was responsible for delivering this news to um, the soldiers. So that's why it was challenging, but quite a quite enjoyable trip because of the people that were on the trip. Um, Really, we really gelled together, and it was a kind of a tight unit. Um, also, throughout the trip, we raised a considerable amount of money for a charity. So, I think um, the total is well over uh, thirty-five thousand we, that we raised for different charities around the country. So, um, again, that was a you know, it's good achievement for people coming home, knowing that they did some good here at home as well as doing the peacekeeping at home or abroad. Um, so, on return then, so now, right now I'm actually the human, I'm the adjutant in the 12th battalion, or in the 3rd battalion. Um, so, I'm basically, it's a human resource role that I'm in. But throughout my career, I have had an extremely enjoyable career. I've been, I suppose, very uh, privileged with the, the in, in military instructors I've had um, instruct me and uh, with particularly with my superiors. Um, I've had some great, throughout the years, I've had some great leaders, you know, that have guided me along the way. I've made great friends. Um, Sporting-wise, I've been fairly heavily involved with Defence Forces Ladies Soccer Team, um, and ha I've had the opportunity to play against uh, the French, uh, French Army, against the Dutch Army, the UK Army, and the Royal Air Force. Um, Last or this year, the ladies' team was supposed to enter its first um, competitive competition. So that would be against other militaries, but it would actually be a competitive competition. And uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, this was uh, postponed. Um, and I've had great, obviously, academic uh, 
opportunities too. Uh, once you get commissioned, you receive a level seven in uh, uh, leadership and defense management uh, studies. And uh, I've also been, had the opportunity to do the MA in, um, it was in the MA in development, so it was bit mainly on peace and conflict development. And then uh, there's a number of other courses that I've completed that would be in line with a kind of military training. So to date, I've like, you can only say, I suppose, good things about the Army. It's, it has been quite good to me, and I've had a, an extremely positive experience uh, in my Army career to date. So I'll let Roisin share hers. So my career to date is nowhere near <coughs> as impressive or extensive as Captain Ogan's. I've only been commissioned uh, over a year. So I suppose mine started back in fourth year of secondary school when we got to go to the higher options in the RDS and the army were putting on a display basically. And it was from then on that I kind of felt that that's what I wanted to do. So I went and finished my leaving cert and on finishing my leaving cert, I kind of decided I still felt a little bit too young or not mature enough just yet. So I decided to go to college to get my degree. So I went and studied uh, sports management and coaching, specifically in rugby in Carlo IT. Um, then at the end of my four year degree, then I started looking to go back into the army. And that's when I applied for the cadets. So I got the cadets and I started in September 2017. So I did my 15 months of training, which had a range of amazing experiences, um, mostly good, but some, some not so good. Um, and then I commissioned uh, then in February 2019 to uh, Kilkenny, the 3rd Battalion. So uh, on commissioning, you usually get to go straight to your barracks, but I was sent uh, immediately on an ILSW course. So the ILSW is an infantry light sport weapons course where you spend three months in Collins Barracks in Cork. So I spent three months down in Cork studying three different weapon systems. So on completion of my weapon systems then I got to finally go to Tur Battalion. So when I got to Tur Battalion it was only for a brief period of time because then I was sent off to complete my YO's course, which is a young officer's infantry course. So you touch on a lot of subjects in your 15 months of training through the cadetship, um, some uh, not all in a lot of detail. It's in your YO's course, your young officer's course, where you then start to go into uh, more detail and knowledge of your specific area of expertise. So I spent seven months then in the Curra completing my YOs, and it was just coming towards the end of my seven weeks there that I got uh, notice that I would be then traveling overseas to Lebanon. So I was with the 115th Irish Paul Bath, the same as Captain Hogan's, uh, traveling to Lebanon in last November. So we did the form up and my role was as the welfare officer and platoon commander to the cooks, the welfare staff and the waste management staff. So I was a platoon commander but in a slightly different capacity to that of Captain Hogan's first platoon commander role where she would have had a more tactical uh, platoon ca commander role. Mine was less tactical and more uh, camp based. So the welfare officer's role is basically the uh, maintaining, maintaining the upkeep of the canteen. Um, the canteen is where we would sell uh, all sorts of, whether it be a confectionery or drinks or anything like that. And the funds then are used to fund the welfare account, which we can then spend on anything that people feel they want to get as welfare, whether that be sports, gym equipment, to run welfare events within the canteen. So we would have had different entertainment ev events. Basically anything that would have boosted the morale of the camp out there, uh, welfare would have had a hand in involving. It also gave me the chance to work with some of the locals. So I would uh, obviously to, to be able to attract in these different piece of equipment and stuff, I would have gotten the chance to interact and work with some of the locals, which was a great experience. Um, overall, my first trip was amazing. Like Captain Hogan said, we had a brilliant group. Um, a little bit drawn out at the end due to COVID, but overall, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, 
I'm now back from my leave and I am starting now with a recruit platoon in uh, two weeks time on the 21st of September where I will be basically in charge of all the training, planning and organising of this recruit platoon coming in now in September. So although it's been a short career to date in comparison to Captain Hogan's, it's very much been an enjoyable one and I've loved all the experiences I've gotten to accomplish to date and I look forward to seeing what I can do more in my future career. So. Okay, so that's kind of the end of our, our presentation. I hope we've given you kind of a better insight into the Defence Forces and um, I suppose shown you the different opportunities that are available to members of the Defence Forces. So I suppose if anyone has any questions, we can take them now. Thank you, sorry, I'm going to just say thank you and a round of applause to Captain Margaret Hogan and to Lieutenant Roshan Abishko. I suppose for us mere civilians it's very hard to sort of see the, the huge expansive roles that are in the Defence Forces and I think this is something that Amelia Steen, photographer and, and artist, uh, wanted to bring forth in the exhibition, The Bloods, was to just really show the diversity of roles and experiences, uh, it kind of both roles for the individuals in the Defence Forces but also service to society, which you know we don't necessarily always see. So I wonder, does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? We'll just use the microphone because of um, our viewers at home on YouTube. Just one last question. Yeah, sure. Is the army recruiting uh, as much as it was in the past? Uh, I suppose <coughs> with COVID it's kind of slowed things yes. down. but. As Roshin uh, had said there, the, on the 21st of September, we have a recruit platoon coming into Kilkenny. Every year, the cadet co um, competition happens every year, and it happened this year. There was no, um, it's just extra precautions, I suppose, have been put in place uh, due to COVID, you know, so it, it, it kind of has slowed down the process. But yes, we're definitely recruiting. And um, anyone who actually wants to join, it's on, on military.ie is where all um, the I suppose uh, career opportunities are advertised. So I think at the moment they're recruiting for the naval service um, and some direct entry. Uh, there's some direct entry, I think, um, in Defence Forces School of Music. So they're open, open competitions at the moment, and um, there, like there is always ongoing. It's just you need to keep an eye on, the, on that website. Um, as well as that website, there's actually a number of kind of social media platforms. There's uh, Defence Forces are on, they have a, a Twitter page, an Instagram page, and uh, Facebook is kind of the other big one. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Could I just ask a question about, because yeah. it's really amazing to hear about your service overseas, um, and what an experience, you know, that, that is that most of us don't have. Um, and I just wonder, like, how many overseas opportunities would someone expect to have um, through their career? Like, is that a regular thing that happens or is that quite special? Um, so for junior officers, uh, it's, it's more difficult the more junior you are. So like a, a, a lieutenant will, will definitely go once. A captain can probably go as many times as they want. Um, it just depends on, on your own situation at home. And then as you go up commandants, uh, Commandants is, is again they probably can go as much as they want um, and then as you go higher the opportunities are fewer because there's less uh, appointments in those in those uh, ranks but in listed ranks um, like when I joined initially as a recruit I was overseas within a year it's a little bit different now there's there's a bit of a backlog so it, it could be two or three years before you're over once you join uh, I was very, just very lucky the way things were at the time um, so it, it could be two or three years, but then people kind of tend to be able to, there tend to be opportunities. So like, I suppose you could expect, if you wanted to go, you could nearly go every, every year or two. Um, depends on your own. And then you'll have the case where there's people who are of a specific rank and there are their specialists and they will be expected to go more, more often than, than not. Um, it's not actually a question, it's just a big thank you for all the work that you do do, especially all those um, overseas missions and in peacekeeping and 
um, rescuing migrants who are fleeing war in, in the Mediterranean. Like, that, it, it's humbling listening to that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much again for your really wonderful talk. And uh, just to say to everyone that this is available now on our YouTube page. So you can send all interested recruits uh, to go and have a look. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.